authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled Legislative Proposals to Help Fuel Capital Growth on Main Street. And I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. <clears throat> we all know that small businesses are what drive the American economy. These innovators, entrepreneurs, and risk takers are critical to our country's economic prosperity. Small businesses helped create more than 60% of the nation's new jobs over the past two decades. So if our nation is going to have an economy that provides opportunities for every American, then we must promote and encourage the success and growth of our small businesses and startups. In order to succeed, these companies need capital and credit, the lifeblood for growth, expansion, and job creation. Yet the government continues to construct arbitrary walls that cut them off from essential financing as smaller companies are caught up in red tape created for the largest public companies that have the financial means to hire lawyers, accountants, managers, and consultants uh, to guide them through the sheer size, volume, and complexity of the federal securities laws. Since becoming chairman of this, of this subcommittee, one of my biggest concerns is the declining number of public companies, which has led to fewer investment opportunities for Main Street investors. IPOs, or uh, initial public offerings, have historically been one of the most meaningful steps in the lifestyle of a, a life cycle of a company. Going public not only affords companies many benefits, including access to capital markets, but IPOs are also important to the investing public. However, uh, over the past two decades, our nation has experienced a 37% decline in the number of U.S. listed companies. Equally troubling in my eyes, we have seen the number of public companies fall to around 5,700. These statistics are concerning because they are similar to the data that we saw in the 1980s when our economy was less than half of its current size. These statistics demonstrate that regulatory costs associated with going public is deterring new and emerging companies from making the decision to go public, thus preventing our capital markets from reaching their full potential. However, Congress has made strides in tailoring the regulatory environment for smaller companies, most notably when we passed with strong bipartisan support the Jumpstart Our Business Startups, or JOBS Act, in 2012. Signed into law on April 5 of 2012, the JOBS Act, which consisted of six bills that originated here in the House Financial Services Committee, was designed to help small companies gain access to capital markets by lifting burdensome securities regulation. By helping small companies obtain funding, the JOBS Act has facilitated economic growth and job creation. You know, even President Obama called the law a game changer for entrepreneurs and capital formation. To further quote the words of former President Obama, the first Jobs Act was, quote, one of useful and important step along the journey of removing barriers that were preventing aspiring entrepreneurs from getting funding. I completely agree. Unfortunately, we need capital, uh, much needed capital is unnecessarily left, being, left on the sidelines right now. These small businesses make up 99% of all enterprises in America and employ about half of the American workforce, but they are being left behind as our economy continues to recover. The big are getting bigger, the small are getting smaller, and fewer small businesses are actually forming in the first place. Regulatory tape is preventing small businesses from realizing their full potential, while small and middle market business optimism hover around record levels, burdensome red tape still is their ability, uh, it hampers their ability to obtain important capital to grow and thrive. Small businesses depend on access to financing to get off the ground, sustain operations, manage cash, make payroll, and create jobs, the very financing that all too often doesn't come through. Implementation of the JOBS Act has demonstrated that while today's capital formation framework is better than it was six years ago, those six years have made clear that the JOBS Act was not just some magic formula. Aspects of the JOBS Act, as well as JOBS 2.0, can and should be improved, and other reforms should be implemented to further unleash innovation. Our hearing today will examine several legislative proposals that will help fuel capital and economic growth on Main Street. Many of those proposals were outlined in the Expanding the On-Ramp report that was released last month by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for Capital Markets Competitiveness, BIO, SIFMA, NASDAQ, National Venture Capital Association, American Securities Association, Dealer, uh, Equity Dealers of America, and TechNet. It's time for Congress to advance a broader capital formation agenda. Let's continue to build upon the success of the Bipartisan Jobs Act by further modernizing our nation's securities regulatory structure to ensure a free flow of capital, job creation, and economic growth. It's time to get the federal government working to support innovation, reward hardworking Americans, and lay the groundwork for tomorrow's economy.
And uh, with that, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. I thank minutes. the chairman for calling this important uh, meeting and welcome to all of our panelists. This hearing will consider 11 different bills designed to increase uh, capital formation. Some of these bills have been considered by this committee before, while others are new proposals that we're seeing for the first time. One bill in particular, H.R. 5054, which is the XBRL bill, is something I've expressed a strong opposition to, and I continue to believe this proposal will harm, not help, capital formation, especially for small companies. Uh, structured data like XBRL has enormous potential to improve our financial markets, it's the wave of the future, to make them more efficient, more transparent, and more accessible to ordinary investors. Structured data puts all public companies, large and small, on a level playing field by making it easy for investors and analysts to quickly download standardized financial statements for an entire industry and immediately start making cross-company comparisons to identify the best performers. This will enable investors to more easily identify those small companies with innovative business models that are true diamonds in the rough. Ultimately, this makes our markets more efficient and our economy more productive and helps small businesses. So I am still very concerned about a proposal that would completely exempt over 50% of all public companies from the requirement to file their financial statements using the efficient XBRL model. Another bill, H.R. Uh, 5756, would make it more difficult for shareholders to influence the management of the companies that they own. Uh, currently, the shareholders can refile a proposal, which will get voted on at the company's annual meeting. If it received at least 3% of the vote the first time, it was submitted. 6% the second time, 10% the third. H.R. 5756 would make it more difficult for shareholders to refile proposals by raising these thresholds to 6, 15, and 30 percent. Oftentimes, these proposals that the shareholders put forward help the companies grow their innovative ideas. According to a letter from the Council of Institutional Investors, and I quote, it often takes several years for a proposal regarding an emerging issue to gain enough traction with investors to achieve double-digit votes, end quote. But they go on to note that in many cases, these pro proposals eventually receive substantial support, leading to widespread adoption by companies, end quote. So cutting off these shareholder proposals on emerging issues could prevent positive long-term um, changes from being adopted. Finally, H.R. 5877, introduced by uh, Mr. Emmer, would allow for a new type of exchange specifically for small companies, a so-called venture exchange. I am certainly not opposed to the concept of a venture exchange, but I, I think it's important to get the details right. In particular, the bill would exempt any stocks traded on a venture exchange from state securities laws, which has historically only been allowed for larger, more mature companies that trade on full national securities exchanges. I'll be interested to hear from our witnesses on whether this state preemption is truly necessary for venture exchanges to be successful, or if there are alternatives that could achieve the same goal without state preemption, which is always contentious. As I noted earlier, many of these are new proposals that this subcommittee has not considered before. So I'm very eager to hear the testimony today and before I yield back, I'd like to place in the record several letters that uh, industry representatives have asked me to put in the record, one from the Council of Institutional Investors, one from Morningstar, one from OTC Markets, and XBRL US. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection. And I thank very much the chairman. I look forward to the testimony, and I yield back. Thank you. Generally, yields back. We, too, are looking forward to this testimony. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Mr. Hultgren, for Thank one you. Minute. Thank you, Chairman Heisinger, for uh, convening this hearing. Uh, access to capital markets and job creation is incredibly important to my district, and this uh, subcommittee has key responsibilities in making sure the U.S. capital markets remain competitive. 
I believe that it is extremely important for us to continue this work. I'd also like to thank our witnesses for their work on the recent report, expanding the on-ramp recommendations to help more companies go and stay public. The experts we have before us today will be important partners as we craft more legislation in the spirit of the JOBS Act. I know the JOBS Act uh, has made a meaningful impact in Illinois, and I'm eager to hear how Congress can do more to spur capital formation. The Encouraging Employee Ownership Act, which I sponsored with John Delaney uh, here in the House, will soon be on its way to the President's desk for a signature, and I'm hopeful to work on new legislation to help with job growth in Illinois. And as has already been stated, and I know will be stated uh, multiple times, uh, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that the number of public companies today is about half what it was 20 years ago. We went from about 8,000 public companies in 1996 to some 4,400 public companies today. We need to learn more why this is and how Congress can help change the trajectory. Thank you, and I yield back. General Neal Zach, back. Uh, today we welcome the testimony of uh, a, a large panel, but we think we wanted to get a cross section of a number of uh, things uh, to and issues to uh, to deal with today. Uh, first and uh, foremost, we have Mr. Brett Paskey, a managing director and head of capital markets for William Blair on behalf of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, or SIFMA. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Edward Knight, Executive Vice President and General Counsel for NASDAQ, uh, OMX. Uh, next, we have Mr. John C. Coffey, Jr., who is the Adolph A. Burrell Professor of Law at Columbia Law University, uh, or Law School. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Barry Hahn, uh, Chief Financial Officer of Glycomimetrics, uh, uh, Incorporated, on behalf of the Biotechnology Innovation, or Bio, organization. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Barry Eggers, uh, founding partner of Lightspeed Venture Partners on behalf of the National Venture Capital Association. Uh, Tyler Galosh is next, uh, who is the executive director of Healthy Markets Association. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Tom Quadman, from, uh, who is the vice president, Center for Capital Markets Competitiveness with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give uh, uh, an oral presentation of your testimony. Uh, simple math uh, says we have 35 minutes of uh, testimony in front of us here, uh, so feel free if you uh, have the ability to shorten that up uh, so we could get to questions. Uh, that, is, uh, that is fine, but it is your five minutes. And uh, with that, Mr. Mr. Paskey, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Heisinga, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the importance of preserving the vibrancy of our public capital markets. My name is Brett Paskey, and I'm the head of equity capital markets at William Blair, testifying today on behalf of SIFMA. I joined this industry because I wanted to help business founders raise capital to build companies, invent products, solve problems, cure diseases, create jobs, and provide wealth creation opportunities for the investing public. All these years and many deals later, I'm still motivated and inspired by the opportunity to help our clients achieve their missions. On the capital market side of William Blair's business, for which I am responsible, we are best known for serving the needs of small and mid-cap growth companies, including many innovative leaders in technology, healthcare, and life sciences. Over the last 10 years, we've been an underwriter on approximately 20% of all U.S. listed IPOs. I will do my best to bring these perspectives and experiences to the subcommittee today, as I did in serving on the task force that put together the recommendations that ultimately created the JOBS Act. I still believe, as I believed then, that no single policy change will reverse the decline in publicly listed companies or unlock the IPO market. The authors of the JOBS Act understood this and wisely took a holistic approach to improving capital formation. Policymakers today should take on our present challenges with a similar mindset. It's difficult to overstate the changes that have occurred in U.S. public capital markets over the last 20 years. An explosion in private funding, the rise of index and passive investing, electronic trading, hedge funds, consolidation, and regulation have all played a role in reshaping our markets. Unfortunately, not all of these changes have been positive. As has been noted often, the number of publicly listed companies in the U.S. has fallen by almost 50% since 1996. The explosion of private capital markets has allowed companies to grow their businesses and valuations without ever tapping public markets. It's worth discussing why this evolution matters. One important implication is that many startup companies are being built to be sold, 
as opposed to being built to be independent public companies. This often does not lead to the same level of expansion and job growth that a long life as an independent public company does. Another important implication is that access to the private markets is limited to a much smaller group of high net worth individuals and institutions, effectively excluding retail investors from the value creation that occurs within these opportunities. Our public companies, our public markets provide much greater access to wealth creation, from direct retail investing to the mutual funds that manage money on behalf of individuals, retirement plans, pension funds, and endowments. Indeed, the need to support our public capital markets is why SIFMA and a broad coalition of stakeholders joined together recently to produce a report on these topics. We also support many of the draft bills that have been released alongside this hearing, and in particular, would note the draft legislation which would extend the EGC on-ramp from five to 10 years. The Job Act's on-ramp of tailored financial reporting requirements and auditing and accounting standards greatly ease the burden for smaller companies going public. Providing a longer runway for companies to scale up to the full reporting requirements should incentivize more issuers to go and stay public. We also have the benefit now of having seen companies operate under these rules and investors react to them for five years, which can inform that extension. Another critical topic to explore is the provisioning of research on publicly traded companies, which I believe is one of the most important and least understood facets of our public capital markets. At William Blair, we provide sell-side research for over 600 public companies with a focus on small and mid-cap stocks. SEC Rule 139 provides a safe harbor for research produced by broker-dealers participating in distribution if the issuer is a large reporting company under the 34 Act. We feel that this safe harbor should be extended to smaller issuers as well. In conclusion, I would flag that policymakers certainly have a challenge before them, improving the vibrancy of our public capital markets while balancing investor protections. But the U.S. capital markets are the envy of the world and worth the effort to preserve. SIFMA and its members stand ready to assist the committee and the SEC in this important endeavor, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, with that, Mr. Knight, uh, welcome back, and uh, you are recognized for five minutes. And if you can uh, make sure that microphone is on and close to you. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Maloney. I'm Ed Knight, and I'm the Chief Legal and Policy Officer at NASDAQ. And the question before you today is, how can we ensure the continued success of the U.S. public company model? When we think about that at NASDAQ, we go back to the beginning of our history in 1971, where we were the first in the world to have an all-electronic market with enhanced transparency through technology to protect investors. Many thought we would fail. Many were against it. But the laws in the United States and regulations were flexible enough to allow it. We did succeed, and today we have 2,977 highly innovative entrepreneurial companies creating jobs and growing the economy every day. Among those companies are the five largest operating companies on the globe. But at the core of our DNA is working every day to make a market for early stage companies, high growth companies that will be the future Amazons, Googles, and Microsofts. A little over a year ago, we looked at the question of the vibrancy of our markets and found that they were not very attractive to uh, entrepreneurs. And very importantly, they did not meet the needs of individual investors who were often locked out of investing in these early stage high growth companies. We looked at what were the possible solutions. We consulted experts from around the country and we put together a number of proposals that we're proud to say are embedded in some of the uh, legislation before you today. This legislation does not represent radical change. We are not suggesting that you defund the SEC. We like the SEC. We want you to fund the SEC. We are not suggesting that we depart from the materiality disclosure standard that's embedded in U.S. law. These are largely technical changes. Some of these changes have been proposed by the SEC or adopted by the SEC through regulation. Some of them are extensions of the JOBS Act. And frankly, we do not believe these are partisan issues. The JOBS Act was signed in a Rose Garden ceremony 
by President Obama. I served seven years in the Clinton administration Treasury Department. Such considerations are not relevant to this debate, in my view. The changes that are being proposed are part of the natural process of updating rules based upon experience with regulation. We work with these rules every day. They directly regulate our economy. In some cases, we've worked with them for decades. We know what works and what doesn't. The economy evolves rapidly, and our regulations should also evolve with it. If these changes are merely technical, why do we care? Why do you have this coalition that supports it so strongly? Is there some hidden agenda here? I would submit that by moving forward with these ideas, all that Congress is doing is signaling a willingness to work alongside entrepreneurs to make the market stronger while preserving investor protection. This builds business confidence, which is the cheapest form of economic stimulus. I want to just highlight a couple of uh, elements of the bills bef before you. The venture exchange legislation addresses an issue that everyone recognizes that works with the markets, and that is they are designed to help large companies trade their securities. They are not designed to help small companies do it. The market structure that applies today fragments liquidity across 50 or more venues. The venture legislation would allow a company, not a stock exchange, not a broker dealer, but the company to elect to have all that liquidity trade at one place so we would have deeper liquidity and these markets would work better for smaller companies. The 10Q optionality bill, I would submit, would enhance disclosure by putting before investors an enhanced uh, uh, financial disclosure. At this uh, moment, we have a two-part disclosure regime in which companies file an 8K with their financial res results, and a few weeks later, a 10Q that no one reads. Give them the option, as under the venture legislation, the company the option to consolidate the material changes since their last quarter along with their financial disclosures instead of making them uh, file a 10Q, which most people do not read. What moves the market is the 8K, not the 10Q. Uh, the selling disclosure legislation would also enhance uh, disclosure. We have disclosure about long holdings but not short holdings. Uh, much of the other legislation, as I said, is our extensions of ideas that the SEC has proposed in the Obama administration that have been part of regulations that have been adopted by the SEC and would codify those. Uh, we sorry, think they are modest. I'm sorry, Mr. Knight, Thank you. Your, your time has expired. I'm going to try and keep a tight rein on that uh, for this. And uh, with that, uh, uh, Mr. Coffey, uh, you, are, uh, you are afforded five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Maloney, and fellow members of the committee. We have essentially been asked to comment on 11 proposals. An overview, I think these proposals range the gamut from promising ideas. C could I ask that you just pull the mic a little closer? To, yeah, point it at you. That's great. Thank you. I think the 11 uh, draft bills uh, range the gamut from promising ideas and useful studies that should be conducted to ideas that are irredeemably bad and would degrade our disclosure system. But all these 11 ideas come from one common source, this expanding the on-ramp study. And it, in turn, in connection with the JOBS Act, uh, is based on the same idea that moved the JOBS Act, that somehow the SEC discourages IPOs because of over-regulation and very costly rules. I think the vast majority of professors who study this area, both law professors and finance professors, think that's very overstated and borders on a myth. It's a myth that gets perpetually, uh, irrede continually asserted, and I think we should understand what reality looks like. The world changed dramatically in 2001 when the high, hot issue bubble crashed. We've never approached that level of IPO sin. It was like the falling off of a cliff. Uh, and what caused this? Well, we should remember that under-regulation can be even more dangerous than over-regulation. Under-regulation caused investors to flee the new issue market, and we've never gotten many of them back, okay? The JOBS Act didn't really cure this problem at all. 
IPO volume continued to fall, and in 2015 and 2016, it was lower than in years before the JOBS Act. Although there has been some comeback this year in high-tech offerings, the smaller offering continues to approach extinction. Small offerings are both few and generally unprofitable. Now, if all this were caused by high regulatory costs and SEC overregulation, then the decline in IPOs would be a uniquely American problem caused by American overregulation. But it's not an American problem. It's a worldwide problem. IPO volume has declined even more dramatically in Canada, and the decline in Europe and Japan is as great as the decline in the U.S. of IPOs by number of offerings. And because Canada has no national securities regulator, there is no over-regulating national advisor. There are 11 different provinces, and IPOs are virtually extinct in Canada currently. Something else is causing the problem. What else is it? I'll give you two principal causes, although there are others. They would be, first, private companies find it easier, quicker, and cheaper to raise capital in robust private markets, where litigation risk is much, much lower. Private firms can raise capital in these markets in weeks, not months, and with much less diversion of executive time. That's reason one. Two, IPOs for smaller firms have been consistently unsuccessful for a sustained period. Jay Ritter, a prominent finance economist, in his latest study finds that about 80 to 90 percent of these small offerings are characterized by negative earnings per share in subsequent years. In short, small issuers remain unprofitable, and as a result, analysts and underwriters are coming to shun these deals. Uh, academic research suggests that the relative disappearance of small IPOs is probably because these smaller issuers cannot gain the economies of scale and scope that are increasingly necessary to compete in a globalizing market. Now, is there a crisis? I suggest not. Uh, companies can get capital easily in the venture capital market, and the smaller firms, although I wish they could find a way to do an IPO, can get successful exit strategies through the merger market. Frankly, the smaller firm gets a much higher price in the merger market than in the IPO market, and thus it will go in that direction. All right, given these problems, I don't think we should relax disclosure and governance standards to encourage more small IPOs that are already losing money. My last half minute, let me give you my nominations for the best and worst ideas among these 11. I think one truly promising idea is venture exchanges, but it has a very flawed execution here. The way this bill is drafted, it looks like a fly-by-night group could set up uh, its own venture exchange tomorrow, and the SEC would be, would be in the position of an overworked fireman racing from fire to fire to put out the various crises. And if you think that's not possible, you should look at what's going on in the cryptocurrencies exchanges where we see some very disreputable people lurking behind exchanges. Uh, the idea that I think is most problematic, and I'll stop here, is the idea of substituting a press release for the Form 10-Q. That would really end our disclosure system as we know it today. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. And uh, with that, I uh, owe Mr. Brian Hahn a, uh, an apology. I was going down my list, and Barry Eggers and Brian Hahn sitting next to each other. So with that, Mr. Brian Hahn, uh, you have five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Agzinga, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the Capital Markets Security and Investment Subcommittee. My name is Brian Hahn, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Glycomon Medics, a 48-employee public company based in Rockville, Maryland. I'm happy to be here today to discuss proposals to help fuel capital and growth and how they will help Glycomedics and other early-stage biotechnology companies in our pursuit to fund the next generation of treatments. The ability of growing business to access the public markets is of paramount importance to biotechnology innovation because investment capital is the lifeblood of scientific advancement. It can cost over a billion dollars to develop a single treatment, and most companies spend more than a decade in the lab before their first therapy is approved. During this long development process, virtually every dollar spent by an emerging biotech company comes directly from investors. To that end, the JOBS Act has been an unqualified success, enhancing capital formation and allowing 260 biotechnology companies to focus on science. It certainly helped pave the way for Glycomedics IPO in two, January 2014, and has helped us nearly double our employee headcount and move three new drug candidates into human clinical trials. Given the long development timelines and substantial costs, legislation being considered today that would extend the JOBS Act on-ramp and provide other relief for emerging innovators would be extremely beneficial for growing companies like mine. 
When glycomedics rolls off its EGC status in a few short months, we will lose the key Jobs Act exemption and will be subject to the erroneous and expensive disclosure burdens as mandated by Sarbanes-Oxley Section 404B. While a private company, our audit fees were just 40000 a year. After our IPO, our audit fees increased by roughly 500000 due to existing regulatory environment for public companies. Absent additional exemption, we expect our SOX 404B compliance obligations to alone more than double our cost to as much as $1.2 million annually starting in January 2019 when our five-year exemption ends. I'd like to thank Representative Kirsten Sienema and Trey Hollingsworth and the subcommittee for their efforts in drafting H.R. 1645, the Fostering Innovation Act. This bill recognizes that a company that maintains the characteristics of an EGC is very much still an emerging company, even if it's been public for longer than five years. I'm hopeful that the Senate will also recognize the importance of the Fostering Innovation Act in a timely manner before any more companies are rolled off the Jobs Act provision and subject to the erroneous auditor attestation burdens. In addition, draft legislation being considered by the committee today that expands the SEC's definition of non-accelerated filer would also help small business innovators avoid the burdens of Section 404B. Under current SEC rules, companies qualify both as an SRC and a non-accelerated filer if their public float falls below $75 million. SRCs benefit from scaled obligation under Regulation SK and Regulation SX, while non-accelerated filers are exempt from Section 404B. Increasing the public float cap and ending an annual revenue test would be a tremendous benefit to small business innovators. Another issue of concern for small public companies is proxy advisory firms. I want to thank Congressman Sean Duffy and Gregory Meeks for their bill, H.R. 4015, the Corporate Governance Reform and Transparency Act, which passed the House last December on a bipartisan basis. The role of proxy advisory firms has grown to have an outsized influence on the decision-making processes of emerging biotechs and their shareholders. When a proxy firm issues a recommendation that is not applicable to an emerging biotech and remains unwilling to consider alternative approaches or methodologies, it can harm a company's relationship with its shareholders and distract management from the core business of the company. I would also like to thank Representative Duffy for H.R. 5756, which would adjust certain resubmission thresholds for redundant shareholder proposals that burden many small biotechs. I'd like to take a moment to discuss the problem of manipulative short selling and express my support for disclosure regime for short sellers. The unique business model for groundbreaking innovation leaves emerging biotechs particularly vulnerable to stock manipulation. Bio acknowledges that appropriate shorting can support the stable, liquid markets that fuel the growth of emerging biotech innovators. However, we strongly believe that current lack of transparency related to short positions is enabling trading behaviors that unfairly harm growing companies long-term investors, and most importantly, patients. Finally, I'd like to mention XBRL compliance, an issue that seems technical but can have significant costs for small companies like mine. The extensible business reporting language is an attempt to make it easier for investors to compare financial data, but with, as with many of the issues I've discussed today, it disproportionately affects small issuers due to its one-size-fits-all approach. Cost of compliance can be significant. Glycomedics is forced to spend 50 to 60,000 every year on XBRL and without much benefit to investors. Biotech investors are less concerned with the reporting metrics that XBRL compares and more concerned with the actual science of the company and their path forward toward FDA approval and ultimately getting a drug to the market. Bio appreciates, therefore, Congressman David Kustoff's legislation, H.R. 5054, the Small Company Disclosure Simplification Act that exempts EGCs from XBRL reporting requirements and provides temporary XBRL exemptions for companies with revenues below $250 million. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for considering further initiatives of small, all small business innovators, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. With that, Mr. Eggers, you have five minutes. Chairman Heisenga and Ranking Member Maloney, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the important subject of capital markets reform and encouraging more U.S. public companies. My name is Barry Eggers, and I'm a founding partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners, a venture capital firm that invests in and works closely with cutting-edge technology startups. We invest in areas such as information technology, big data, cloud computing, networking, e-commerce, and consumer marketplaces. I am here in my capacity as a board member of the National Venture Capital Association. Let me begin by explaining why venture capitalists care about policy issues pertaining to our public capital markets. There are three main ways that venture capitalists exit an investment. Number one, a merger acquisition. Number two, an initial public offering or IPO. Or number three, a business failure. While the vast majority of venture capital investments are in private emerging growth companies, or EGCs, recent research has shown that nearly half of all companies that have gone public since 1979 have been backed by venture capital. In other words, VCs build the product for the IPO pipeline. To provide a little background on venture capital, we are investors in the nation's startups. 
At Lightspeed, for instance, we invest early in a company's life, often when there are few founders trying to build out a new concept. We work with these entrepreneurs to grow the company into a successful enterprise, including providing mentorship and strategic advice, helping them hire new employees, introducing them to potential customers, and providing additional rounds of financing to fuel continued growth. This work typically takes a lot of patience over a long time horizon. At Lightspeed, the average time to IPO from first investment is roughly <coughs> eight years. I've been a venture capitalist for over two decades and in the technology ecosystem for over 30 years. When I first got started in the business, the goal of most entrepreneurs was an IPO, and many companies were successful in that endeavor, such as Maker Communications, a company I invested in that went public in 1999. Maker had quarterly revenue of $3 million prior to their IPO, and went public at a valuation of $230 million. 20 years later, many entrepreneurs now view the public markets as hostile to small cap companies and would rather have the certainty of a trade sale than deal with the challenges, complexities, and costs of running a public company. And for those that do go public, they often do so when they've grown to a size that can better bear the burdens that come with being public, such as Nimble Storage, another company I invested in which went public in December of 2013 and is representative of the first batch of EGCs to go public under the 2012 Jobs Act. Nimble had quarterly revenue of $33 million prior to their IPO, which valued them at $1.5 billion, over 10 times larger in revenue and six times more valuable than Maker. My firm, Lightspeed, has one of the strongest track records of IPO since 2016. We have seven portfolio companies go public over the last two and a half years, but that is still less than 5% of the 145 active companies in our portfolio. Avoiding the public markets has unfortunately become a prevalent view among many EGC executives. The issues that discourage EGCs from going public can be grouped into three broad, broad categories. Number one, the increased costs and complexity of running a company. Number two, the collapse of market-making infrastructure, including research coverage. And number three, the challenges presented by culture of short-termism. In each category since the turn of the millennium, policy changes and industry trends have conspired to increase the headwinds facing small public companies. I believe there are two significant consequences arise from the lack of IPOs and the decline in U.S. public companies, less job creation and loss of investment opportunities for retail investors. Research indicates that the lack of IPOs has cost the economy on average about 2 million new jobs a year. From what I've seen, many of these jobs can be the type that support middle class families and don't necessarily require college degrees. Thinking, for instance, about human resources or administration jobs, which often disappear after a merger. The lack of IPOs has also had an impact on middle class retirement savings and retail investor portfolios. Think about Amazon, Genentech, Microsoft, or Intel as examples of companies that created exponentially more wealth in the public markets than private markets. The joint report endorsed by NVCA expanding the on-wrap offers a blueprint for building off the success of the Jobs Act and making it more attractive to be a public company. The report considers a breadth of perspectives from company operators, people whose job it is to facilitate public offerings, exchanges, and investors. While I note several policy proposals in my written testimony, I did want to take time to reference one now. I strongly support the proposal to allow any investment in an EGC to be qualifying for purposes of the VC exemption definition from the RIA regulatory regime. Congress created both the EGC definition and the VC exemption for similar purposes, namely a favorable capital formation regulatory environment for growing companies. That secondary share purchases of EGCs are currently non-qualifying. It's becoming an increasing challenge for VC funds that are forced to choose between supporting their company's growth while risking the significant expense and difficulty of registration or passing on further capital formation opportunities for certain portfolio companies. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Eggers. With that, Mr. Galash, you uh, have five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Heisinga, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding the hearing today and for offering us the opportunity to appear. I'm the Executive Director of Healthy Markets Association, and our members are the pension funds and investment advisors that folks here seem to be concerned with in the public markets. And today we're here to discuss at least 11 legislative proposals, so let me cut to the chase. Not one of these proposals is likely to measurably increase the investment in public capital markets or improve the economy for Main Street, and several of the proposals are likely to have the opposite effect. The reason is simple. They either, they either ignore or affirmatively harm investors in the public markets. From the vantage point of an investor in the public markets, these proposals reduce the quantity, quality, or utility of information available to them. They increase the riskiness of a company's financials, such as by removing 
required audits of internal controls. They increased the valuation risks of a company. They increased the costs of trading those securities. They divert investment opportunities from the public markets by further easing limits on private securities, such as through ventures exchanges. And they decrease corporate accountability to shareholders by restricting shareholder proposals, by reducing access to proxy advisors or other reforms. The proposals aren't offering any reason for investors to want to put more money into the public capital markets. And so I'll argue that they'll likely have the effect. I appreciate the chairman's focus and many of the folks here on the public markets, but of course they matter. The public securities are often accompanied by more robust accounting and financial business disclosure practices, and that's a given. But they're also information about public companies, including third-party research, is more readily available and fairly distributed. Public securities are far more easily and reliably valued. And really importantly, from an investor's perspective, liquidity is significantly greater. Trading costs are significantly lower. If we're talking about fractions of a penny a share or a penny a share or maybe a few pennies a share in the public markets, we're talking orders of magnitude greater costs for investors in the private markets. And frankly, that's a transaction cost that's lost returns for investors. Public securities are much more easily benchmarked, such as against the S&P 500. These factors play an important role for pension funds and investment advisors who are fiduciaries to their beneficiaries to minimize costs and minimize risks. Unfortunately for them, as many have noted here, the public markets have dwindled. The vast majority of the decrease in public companies, 2,800 of the lost companies, were lost before 2003. That's well before Sarbanes-Oxley and well before the Dodd-Frank Act and its CEO pay ratio disclosures. And it was after proposals and, that were implemented in the 1990s to curtail private uh, litigation. So if those things didn't cause the decline, what did? Well, a lot of things. But most importantly, the SEC and Congress, frankly at the urging of many of the folks I sit on the panel here with today, spent years digging trenches to drain capital and companies out of the public markets, usually in the name of promoting access to capital for small companies. So put simply, many companies don't go public anymore because they can do things like raising money. We talked about the explosion of private capital. That's it. We've made it so that you can do a private offering with a Super Bowl halftime commercial. You can do it over an internet radio ad. That was never allowed before. Policymakers and regulators' obsession with IPOs is also somewhat misplaced. Do we really think it's a good idea to return to the 1990s when a sock puppet can raise millions of dollars in an IPO? Could it be that, as, as Mr. Coffey alluded to, that perhaps public investors are concerned with IPOs because they've chronically underperformed the markets and that a lot of the IPOs that do come to market these days are exits from folks like venture capital firms and, and executives? Do we really think that undercutting the reliability of companies' financial reports or companies' accountability to shareholders is going to make investors more interested? We don't. So we offer three alternatives. First, we share the concerns with many about the lack of good research into small cap companies. But rather than forcing investors to pay more for trading, as the failed tick pilot suggested, how about we let investors separately shop for research in a transparent market? To do that, we encourage you to direct the SEC to empower investors to be able to separately shop for the research they want and the trading services they need. Second, we encourage you to reduce the exemptions and exemptions from the federal securities laws. We should stop digging trenches out of the public capital markets. It's time to put down the shovels. Third, we urge you to think about rules that promote industry consolidation. The difference between large and small cap companies and raising capital has a lot of reasons. And I Thank you I, uh, for the opportunity to speak before you, and I look forward to questions. Appreciate that. And Mr. Quadman, you have five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Huizinga, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, we appreciate this subcommittee's continued focus on issues related to business creation and, and growth. The atmosphere for business creation and the path for growth is not what it should be. Systems that have supported the ability of businesses to start and then grow from small to large have not kept pace with the times or international competition. We have seen 10 years after the financial crisis continue to press business creation rates and we are continue to be hundreds of thousands of businesses short from where we should be historically. We have also seen a 20 year decline in the number of public companies and an anemic IPO market over the same period of time. Indeed, we've seen a calcification of entrepreneurship where 50% of all business startups in the United States are concentrated in 20 counties. <clears throat> 
So action is needed. There are several reasons for these problems, and much needs to be done to address the situation. Indeed, some things have already been done. The JOBS Act and the JOBS Act 2.0 measures in the highway bill have arrested the decline of public companies, and we've seen a modest increase in IPOs in four of the six years since the JOBS Act passed. S2155, which is passed by the House yesterday and should be signed soon by the President, helps to restore community and regional banks to being a Main Street business liquidity provider. However, it is important to remember that 75% of all business financing and development happens in the non-bank financial markets. So more needs to be done and we need to reverse this situation. That is why the Chamber and other seven other trade associations under the leadership of Brian O'Shea last month issued a report on expanding the IPO on-ramp. That report includes 22 recommendations which are centered around Jobs Act enhancements, increased research, corporate governance and disclosure improvements, financial reporting issues, and equity market structure reforms. These ideas and many of the bills already passed by the House can form a core of a Jobs Act 3.0. Indeed, the bills that uh, we are discussing today are a good step forward. These bills will increase liquidity, extend Jobs Act protections, address the resubmission thresholds issue, reduce redundant uh, disclosures, establish venture exchanges, and generally remove obstacles to growth. Indeed, last month we also released a poll which shows widespread support uh, for these measures. Indeed, over 90% of Americans fee agree that there needs to be an, a level playing field for IPOs and also agree that uh, the rules of regulators should promote growth and that all investors should benefit from them. Additionally, over 75% of, of Americans believe that regulators should simplify the IPO process and ag also agree that uh, government policies should be geared for growth. Those, uh, that support cuts across all ideological, generational, and economic uh, lines. And we also can't wait because of international competition. The China 2025 and 2050 plans are specifically geared to, take, uh, to make China, and not the United States, the innovation center moving forward. Also, the EU, with its Capital Markets Union proposal, they are also looking to build out their non-bank financial system, in fact, copying many of the things that we do here in the United States. However, many of the Brexit-related proposals are also specifically designed to keep American financial firms out. Indeed, the EU also sees itself as a global regulator. Their MIFID directed directive specifically impacts research here in the United States and, in fact, will make it more difficult for Congress to incentivize research for smaller IPOs. Indeed, um, we have some things that are also positive. The SEC, unlike in 2013, is a willing partner to work on these issues. But it's important to remember that it is Congress that sets the public policy parameters and it is Congress that ultimately will lead us down the road that then the regulators can help fill in the blanks. We look forward to working with the subcommittee on these issues and thank you to take any, and happy to take any questions you may have. Well, A on turning in for 50 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Quadman. <laughs> <laughs> So I, uh, at this time, I will uh, recognize myself for, uh, for five minutes for some questioning. And uh, you know, clearly we heard some contradictory things uh, uh, here. Mr. Hahn, Mr. Eggers, you had both talked about, uh, um, I think Mr. Eggers talked about an, an, an EGC that uh, had gone public. Uh, Mr. Hahn, you were talking about some of the other biotech. Um, uh, Professor Coffey had said that there really isn't a problem uh, and that the JOBS Act, I, I got down here, uh, didn't address the issue of IPOs uh, and the lack of IPOs at all. Um, and uh, so I, I'm kind of curious, I mean, is this worth pursuing? I mean, we're, we're looking at a, uh, we've kind of done a non-legislative but uh, uh, a package, but a Jobs 2.0 previously. We're kind of working on a Jobs 3.0, for lack of a better uh, working title at this point. Um, but did we have a problem, and did the Jobs Act and these types of reforms actually address the problem? Mr. Hahn, Mr. Eggers. I think the Jobs Act did, did help address these problems, but what I'm sitting here today talking about what I'd like to see is the extension of the five-year on-ramp, especially for us for 404B. You know, we do do a third-party audit of our internal controls that gets reported directly to the audit committee. 
but that costs us less than $50,000 a year. To have, and I have a proposal since next year we'll roll off of that from our audit firm, $650,000 a year for our audit firm to audit those results, and the third party will go from $50,000 a year up to $150,000 a year. And 98% of our balance sheet is still cash. We have no revenues yet. We still only cut 125 checks a month. We still only have two check signers. So for that additional $650,000 to $800,000 in added expense doesn't add any more safety to investors. We have good controls. We, they're audited. So from my standpoint, it's, it's you know, the extension of the EGC until we are, we are producing revenue. Okay. Mr. Eggers? Can you make sure you hit your mic? I do believe it has helped. I've seen it firsthand. I mentioned Nimble Storage, which was one of the first companies to go out under the Jobs Act in December of 2013. They filed confidentially. They were able to work under EGC status. Um, one of the problems, though, is that an EGC status doesn't last very long, potentially, because you can become a large accelerated filer very quickly at the $700 million threshold. When these companies go public, they're very volatile. I looked at the last seven companies that we've taken public since 2016, and in the first six months of trading, the difference between the high price and the low price was on average 68%. So many of those lost their EGC status. And, okay. Um, and uh, I, I think it was Mr. Paskey, you, you had talked a little bit about providing a longer runway. Is that correct? Is that relative to what Mr. Eggers was talking about? Yes, yeah, so there's two things I would say. First, why, why do investors care? One is IPOs have actually outperformed the SCP, S&P 500, in 15, 16, 17, and 18 year to date. So I did want to get out there that IPOs in, are, in fact, working and in a good vehicle for wealth creation. Extending the on-ramp to me, and as I mentioned in my opening statement, I was part of the initial set of recommenders on the task force. There was a time frame on them to see how it worked, to see if the market reacted, if there was pushback from investors, if some of the disclosure um, allowances led to problems or information issues. And as we sit here now, you know, five years later, there really haven't been issues. Virtually every company that has been uh, eligible has taken advantage of those uh, allowances, and there's been really no pushback or valuation differential afforded them by the markets. So it feels that the extension uh, is appropriate for the existing public companies who already came public, but also helps incentivize right. others uh, to pursue real, it. Real quickly, because I think this is one of the things that Professor Coffey brought up. He basically said that there's enough money out there, right? We don't need the IPOs, that they're, the venture. Is there enough cash out there? What, what's, the, what's the purpose for accessing it? So I think that's public. actually a, a, one of the most important points. There is a lot of money out there. It's privately funded. It's, it's being invested by high net worth individuals and venture capital firms. So all the value creation is accruing to very few people. So in an er era where income inequality and wealth equality is such a topic, I think we need to be encouraging greater access to that wealth creation. And there's just no question that the public markets through all its vehicles is the number one way to do that. Well, it's interesting you say that. I literally, I will read verbatim what I had written down. How do common investors, non high net worth investors access the upside of market growth? I mean, that, that in my mind is one of the, one of the major elements in this, uh, in this entire thing. My time is up, and, I, and I'm going to be uh, a little generous here with the, with the questioning since we've got a, few, a couple of few peer, people up here, because I real quickly, I would like uh, Mr. Knight to address um, uh, 5756. Um, is there an issue or a problem, uh, and what do you hear from those public companies who work with or are on, the, uh, on NASDAQ with, uh, with some of those uh, activist um, shareholders and some of their uh, some of their proposals? Well, yes, uh, shareholder activism is a major factor in the public markets. It's a, a reason why some uh, entre entrepreneurs choose not to go public. Uh, shareholders should be active. Shareholders should be engaged. Uh, but it's the short-term focus, often, of activists that distorts the market. And uh, that is why we support legislation that would provide more transparency about shorting the market. Uh, we think that would be healthy. And, uh, but activism uh, is a major factor in the market today, and uh, it, it is uh, 
uh, something uh, many are concerned about. So appropriate for it to be addressed? Yes, yes, okay. sir. All right, my time is well exposed, uh, expired. Uh, with that, uh, the ranking member, or the... Uh, thank, thank you, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome John Coffey back to the, uh, to the panel, and, and I'd like to ask you uh, about the Venture Exchange Bill, which you called uh, promising. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm not opposed to this concept, but I have some concerns about preempting uh, state securities laws, and is there a way to make the venture exchange model work without exempting uh, state uh, laws or, 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 or preempting uh, state laws? Well, I think it will work without preempting it. Okay. If you could hit your mic, please. Right now, the alternative to a venture exchange uh, is the alternative trader, ATS system, which has a number of companies trading over the market. Venture exchanges may prove to be a more interesting, more novel, more creative alternative. We don't know until we try, but we have seen that under regulation ATS, we have small companies trading in the over-the-counter market without a preemption of state blue sky. So. It is possible to have entrepreneurs trade over-the-counter small companies even though they're subject to state blue sky regulation. And frankly, and this is the key point about this, when you have a venture exchange, you're going to have a thin market. Thin markets invite pump and dump schemes. You need resources to monitor those pump and dump schemes, and the SEC tends to focus on bigger issues, bigger, higher profile cases. Uh, we need the states which are very familiar with some of these smaller companies and I think are better monitors for them. That's the problem about preemption. The other problem I was pointing to was that uh, the way this statute is written, the SEC has to shut you down. You can start trading as a venture exchange until the SEC comes in and says you must stop. And I think that puts the SEC under undue pressure. They have to run like a fireman from fire to fire, and I think you will get fly-by-night operators under that kind of structure. But the idea, I still think, is promising. Uh, uh, is, would anyone else like to comment on it? Uh, Just thank, thank you, mm -hmm. Congresswoman. I, I would. I think that there's actually a reason why uh, pension funds and investment advisors aren't beating down the door for more IPOs and pulling companies into the to public markets. And frankly, I think the venture exchange is likely to just make it easier for the existing investors and executives of those companies to exit. But it's not going to be the thing that pulls public pension funds or investment advisors or fiduciaries into those markets. So it's not actually going to have that effect. It's not gonna be able to overcome the costs or risks associated with those private securities. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Maloney. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Maloney, we're supportive of it. And I think one thing to remember here is that the small investor has been shut out. The retail investor has been shut out. And it's a very, this is a platform where one is the SEC can put very robust uh, rules in place for oversight, allow for uh, concentration liquidity, allow for smaller investors to participate in this, and it's just another way and another venue of trying to drive liquidity to smaller public companies. Anybody else? Comments? <laughs> yeah, I would just point out the SEC has six months to license these exchanges. Uh, they have been licensing new exchanges quite rapidly. We now have 13 of them in the United States. No other country has that many. Uh, with regard to NASDAQ and the venture legislation, we would be able to trade these securities because our listing standards are already blue sky exempt by statute and regulation. Uh, so this would encourage more competitors to NASDAQ, which I don't think is a bad idea. We're not against competition. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think there's a way to do it. Uh, Professor Coffey uh, definitely has a point. The state securities regulation plays an important role, but with regard to the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, right now we are exempt. Okay, I, I'd like to also ask about the, the XBRL bill. Um, and I'd like to ask Mr. Gallus, your, your, your organization represents investors, and I believe that it's the investors who benefit the most from a, from a structured data uh, like XBRL. Do you think that exempting over 50% of public companies from the requirement to use XBRL will harm investors and ultimately transparency? And I'd also like to ask uh, Mr. Coffey and anyone else, uh, Mr. Quadman and others, to respond. Thank yes. you. For the for the question, um, I think I'm struck by the dichotomy of two of, of different proposals here. Um, on the one hand, we're saying that we want to encourage uh, research into small companies and the utility of that research into small companies. And on the other hand, we're actually going to make that research less useful for the people who read it, 
Um, XBRL is uh, common and it's something mm -hmm. that uh, folks need to have to uh, compare investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's really interesting here is we're saying on the one hand, we need to do things to promote the research into small companies. And on the other hand, there's a proposal to expressly go in the opposite direction. And Mr. Coffey? Huh? Just one mm -hmm. sentence. Mm -hmm. XBRL is a tool, a cost-saving tool. We want analysts to study the smaller company. They are not doing it now because the costs and benefits don't work out for them. If you reduce mm -hmm. the costs, you might get more analyst attention to smaller mm -hmm. companies. So I think it mm -hmm. will encourage analysts to look at smaller companies. Mm -hmm. Mr. Quadman? Yeah, uh, thank you, Ms. Maloney, for that question. First off, we support uh, use of uh, interactive data like this for investors. However, XBRL, uh, from studies I've seen, only 11% of investors actually use it extensively. That's a CFA study. So this would actually allow for companies to have the option uh, to deal with this, uh, to deal with the costs and, and the like. But I think we also have to understand, too, XBRL is a 1998 platform as we're increasingly going into a blockchain world. So if we can go into a blockchain world where you have a common electronic ledger where everybody's connected with, that is much more transparent and easier to use in an XBRL system. So I think we also need to be very open to other innovative ways of disseminating data. My time has expired. Thank you. Thank all of the panelists. It was very interesting. Thank you. With that, uh, our chair of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, uh, the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Heising, and I thank my, my, my friend, the gentleman from Arkansas, for yielding me um, the opportunity to move ahead of him. Mr. Quadman, welcome back. In your testimony, you noted a 2011 report of uh, the IPO task force found that 92% of public company CEOs said that the administrative burden of public reporting was a significant challenge to completing an IPO and becoming a public company. How does my draft legislation on 10Q reporting help to alleviate that burden? Yeah, so first off, let's remember your, your bill, right, doesn't hide any information. That information is already put out there publicly. It allows companies to do it in a different way. So I think if you take your bill, you take some of the uh, legislation here in terms of shelf registration, right. um, other things such as company file, which we've uh, proposed in the past, it allows for information to uh, be put out there for investors without being done in a redundant fashion and then avoiding those costs. So this isn't hiding the ball for anybody. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Knight, uh, your colleague Tom Whitman testified before this committee last year and noted uh, the NASDAQ believes it is long past time to move away from a one-size-fits-all approach to corporate disclosure. In fact, Mr. Whitman suggested eliminating the archaic 10Q form altogether because it was duplicative and bureaucratic. Can you quickly walk committee members through some of the duplicative standards that exist between the current uh, form 10Q and company earnings releases? Well, the, the premise behind this is, uh, I would quote uh, a famous uh, technology pioneer, uh, Grace Hopper, who was an admiral in the Navy, who said the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it this way. <laughs> and there is a redundancy to disclosure in our system today, but it's undergirded by a principle of materiality. And we think what you've proposed would preserve that materiality while also the key financial disclosures that are required under Reg SK and that come out in an 8K and which is what uh, really moves the market. When you look at the NASDAQ market on any day where there are uh, substantial movements is where someone has had an earnings release and put out their 8K with their full financial disclosure. Now a full few weeks later, they make a, a, a 10Q filing. That filing has a number of things in it, some of it redundant to the K, but uh, any material change since the last disclosure would be in that. We would combine that through your legislation in one disclosure. It would be at the option of the company, uh, and I think that's important, that several pieces of legislation before the subcommittee restore some role for the listed company in how it's regulated and give them some choice. And what, what are the costs and resource burdens on companies that are required 
to file 10-Q forms with the SEC? Well, I, when you're talking about costs, th th there's a dollar cost, but then there is what I referred to in my testimony in my statement, the signaling that goes on through regulation to the f economy, to the business community, about the attitude of regulators and Congress towards what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. When they see things that don't make sense, when they see redundancy, uh, and they think about going public, and that that is a, a very long-term commitment they're making, do they want to be part of that system? Uh, when you signal that you're making the system in the technical aspects more rational, they get more confidence about jumping into that. So it's more than just the, the cost in dollar terms. It's whether the system is being run in a rational way that reflects the fact that these are the companies that are creating the jobs and the growth in this country. Are press releases sufficient for investors to obtain the information they need to make form informed investment decisions? No, no. I mean, the, the, we, it needs to be prescribed, but the current system, I would argue, is redundant, and the cues are really not studied in the same way the K is. So why not use that disclosure to put everything in it, again, at the company's option? All right. Thank you. Yield back the remainder of my time. Gentlelady yields back. With that, uh, the gentleman from Georgia, uh, Mr. Scott, is recognized for five minutes. Chairman, you know, um, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to all of you, and you've got such uh, great knowledge, and uh, each of your testimonies have been very informative. But there is some cross-section going on here one side or the other, and it kind of fits in with some of the um, concerns that um, I have. And I, I want to start by saying that um, I want to emphasize that uh, both the uh, Republicans and Democrats on this committee are willing to work together to make it easier to fuel capital growth in our markets. As a matter of fact, I'm usually the first to jump on board to proposals uh, like that. However, listening to you and just my own research, I'm beginning to get a little word about we're getting to a point where we may be placing too much value on capital uh, growth. And um, maybe we need more evidence and assurances that this actually needs to be done and that we're not compromising the integrity of many of our U.S. firms in our marketplace, which makes our U.S. firms so attractive. Um, so I'm not singling out any bill here, but let me call your attention to the, the discussion draft that has to do with requiring the SEC to revise the definition of a qualifying portfolio a company to include emerging growth companies. And I couldn't help but think, is, is this really necessary? My staff also tells me that in February 2017, the social media company Snapshot filed for an initial public offering claiming uh, EGC status. And I'm pretty sure that the IPO was overprescribed, with many investors clamoring to buy up its shares. Now, the same thing happened in March with uh, Dropbox, uh, when they went public in an oversubscribing offering claiming um, EGC status. So a lot of these discussion drafts and bills amount to sort of like a drip, drip erosion of our security laws. And I'm somewhat worried we may be ignoring the needs of investors and uh, marketplace transparency. And so I'm, you know, this, um, this uh, uh, subject of expanding the on-wrap uh, reports that many of your witness, our witnesses have worked on. Um, but a common trend that I've noticed in these proposals is that uh, 
there's only one direction we go when we balance investor protections versus expanding access to capital. And that direction is always weakening of our disclosure requirements. Now, Mr. Jurlak, uh, is it Jurlak, I'm sorry? Gulak. I, I, I really was intrigued in your testimony because you stressed the importance of considering the impact of these proposals on investors who are contributing to the capital. So could you uh, maybe describe how expanding regulatory accommodations for users might affect the attractiveness of U.S. companies to investors? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I certainly appreciate it. So a, as we've talked about the explosion of private capital, and, and Professor Coffey agreed that he said, gee, there may not be uh, all of this need for capital formation. It's just not yeah. in the public markets anymore. We have to think that when we talk about some of the, uh, the proposals before us, we're trying to make, give, make those investment opportunities more accessible for retail investors. Well, pension funds and big mutual funds are how the predominant number of actual retail investors invest. And the people who have the fiduciary duties to them are saying these private markets are too costly generally and too risky generally for us. And so when we talk about expanding the private markets and making them more accessible to folks, we're not actually going to get those people more involved. Right. At the same time, when you're t looking at the public markets and focusing on the burdens and costs and risks of issuers and the folks that are trying to sell their securities, we're saying, hey, you, the investors in those public securities, we got a great deal for you. It's less. You're going to have less transparency, higher costs, and higher risks. And Mr. Coffey, you agree with uh, Mr. Goodluck on this? And well, my concerns? I agree mainly with your point that at the hope for more IPOs, we shouldn't uh, eliminate, abolish, and downside all of the protections that give shareholders some right to comment on and criticize corporate behavior. Earlier it was mentioned that there is a shareholder proposal rule and that would be downsized by a resubmission provision. I have to tell you that empirically there's a study that shows since 2000, 50.1% of shareholder proposals have gotten less than the 30% level at which they would be cut off Gentlemen, under this time proposal. Has expired. Well, th thank you, Mr. Time expired. Coffee. I appreciate the extra minute too, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, I want to first uh, address my initial questions to Mr. Knight, if I may. And I know this is slightly off topic uh, for the hearing today, but since you're here, I'd value your testimony on legislation that I've introduced uh, to amend the risk and leverage-based capital rules for banks in order to improve liquidity for listed options. I've got several questions I'm going to go through, and then if I could get your response. One, I wondered if you could discuss how improved liquidity decreases spreads and makes it less costly for investors to make use of listed options. And if you could also discuss the importance of liquidity in options markets when there's volatility for the underlying assets. For example, how important is it to have the ability to manage risk through options when there is volatility in equity markets? And then uh, is it fair to say that this is a timely issue that the Federal Reserve and other banking regulators should ad address as soon as possible? And do you share the concern that the timeline for implementation of this standardized approach for counterparty credit risk uh, which proposes to amend the treatment of options and capital rules is too far off. They're saying maybe a couple years away. So several questions there, but wondered if you could respond to that, Mr. Knight. Certainly. I mean, the options market is critical to the management of risk in the underlying uh, cash equities market. Uh, it is a market that's populated mainly by professional traders, by market makers on behalf of uh, financial institutions and investors who are laying off risk through the investment in options. It is a critical market to uh, our economy. Uh, central clearing of those instruments uh, provides stability uh, to the economy and something that is encouraged across markets. The rules that are applied there uh, don't necessarily recognize the capital uh, structure and the investment uh, policies of some of the mid-sized firms that are populating that market and may cause a reduction in their participation in those markets. Uh, there are alternative, more modern capital um, um, markets, capital requirement 
markets for the central clearing houses that uh, the Fed could consider uh, that would uh, preserve the participation of those mid-level market makers, which would provide more uh, price discovery participation, and that would narrow the spreads and narrow the cost to the investing public. Thanks, Mr. Knight. I appreciate that. I'm going to move to uh, Mr. Paskey, if I could. I'm interested in the part of your testimony that discusses the diversified fund limits under the Investment Company Act. I don't believe uh, this is something we've spent much time discussing here in our committee. I wondered if you could discuss the history of the 10% limit on mutual fund positions. Why does it matter if a mutual fund owns 10% or even 50% of a certain company as long as the overall fund remains diversified? And why do you believe it would be appropriate to increase this limit to 15% for diversified funds? So the, the point of the, the rule itself is just for clarity to who you're investing with and alongside, and particularly it's relevant now with the activist rules and activist campaigns, why, why moving the 10% up to 15% is relevant to today's conversation has been one of the, the shining lights of the Jobs Act uh, passage has been the proliferation of life sciences companies. I think the statistic that came out earlier is 260 life sciences companies have gone public since the Jobs Act. Those companies by and large tend to be very small. They're taking drugs through the FDA process. They haven't built out a full staff. They also have a specialized group of investors who invest in a portfolio theory across those 260 in many cases because some are gonna hit and some are gonna miss. So to limit those specialist funds' ability to invest into those funds to help fuel that drug discovery, lead them through um, the FDA process, get them to a point where they're able to commercialize, we think it just really expands the opportunity for them to get the funding they need from high quality specialist funds. And, you know, 10% limit on a company that may come public at a 75 or $100 million market cap, you know, is only seven and a half or $10 million. And that's often insufficient in order to move the uh, drug through the FDA. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Hahn, wonder, do you agree that mutual funds are needl needlessly restrained in their ability to invest in startup companies because of this 10% limitation in the Investment Company Act? And what will increasing this limit mean for the ability of startups to access the capital they need to grow? Uh, when Glycomedics was private, we raised about $65 million. It took us over a year to raise that last $38 million. One of the main reasons we went public in 2014 was access to the capital markets and the, and the quick ability to raise funds. Since uh, we've gone public, we raised over 300 million in the public markets. So access to larger investments, uh, would, we would welcome that. Uh, you know, when we raise money with this, it's a large um, anchor investor we're looking for. And as we were saying, more than, you know, we're looking for a 20 to $30 million investment from anchor order, not, to, not a five to 10 million. Thank you, Mr. Hahn. My time's expired. Uh, next, I will recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for, uh, for really interesting presentations. I um, was there uh, when we were doing this in the original Jobs Act and participated in its uh, formation and ultimately, despite a few reservations, uh, was, was, was happy with its passage. Um, this conversation actually allows me to resurrect a not entirely dead horse to beat um, a little bit. Um, because I was always struck, though I was a supporter of the JOBS Act, the best estimates I could get at the time was that uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and other compliance regimes probably imposed in the neighborhood of one to three million dollars a year of compliance costs, which is real money. But as a guy who used to do IPOs, I was always struck by the fact that I couldn't get anybody to focus on the other area or another area in which there is a lot of money out the door, which of course is the gross spread paid by companies going public. So I did some studies, and lo and behold, there are studies out there that show an absolutely remarkable consistency in pricing of IPOs of 7%. It almost never changes for mid-sized IPOs. And I've been crying in the wilderness. I've had a hard time getting FINRA and SEC, and I've got letters here promising studies and monitoring, and the SEC told me that it's hard to uh, uh, establish the cost incurred by underwriters. Um, it's not. I've done it. Um, and. Um, I just haven't gotten any traction until recently when SEC Commissioner uh, Rob Jackson came out with a speech in April that uh, called the uh, history of the gross spread pricing a middle market IPO tax. So I get to beat this hopefully not dead horse. Mr. Eggers, I'm going to start with you. Does perfectly consistent 7% gross spread IPO pricing and the cost that imposes, which as you know is 14 to $20 million, does that, this comes out of your pocket 
issuers' pockets and IPO uh, investors' pockets. Does, does, does the seven per perfect consistency of 7% growth spreads in this country and not anywhere else in the world, does that feel to you like a competitive market? No, it doesn't. Um, if you remember, in the late 90s, we had the uh, Four Horsemen, which were a mid-market group of bankers that would take companies public. Um, those, all those companies are gone. So we, we have fewer bankers that generally take companies public. Um, most of the time, our best companies want to be taken public by someone like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, or JP Morgan. Um, so there's less competition than there used to be, to answer your question. So I've had a hard time, in addition to getting FINRA and SEC interested in this until Commissioner Jackson gave his speech, I've sort of had a hard time getting the venture capital community, which I know well, interested in pushing on this. Why is that? I'd, I'd be happy to push on this. Okay. I think it's an important Mr. Hahn, you went, thank you, Mr. Eggers. Mr. Hahn, you went public. Do you agree with Mr. Eggers that this doesn't feel like a competitive market? Bankers are helpful in, in accessing the capital markets. I know, I was one. I'm just asking whether the fees they charge are emergent from a truly competitive market. You know, it's, it's always been set at 7%, so it's something we really just didn't question. So, no, I, you know, I think it should be looked at. Okay. Mr. Knight, um, Rob Cook responded to my request for a study, because, look, I've, I've looked at the academic literature, and it's pretty clear. Um, but I don't know everything. Uh, Rob Cook, who's a good friend, by the way, we were in college together, and despite that, I have not been able to extort him into, uh, into doing this study. Um, FINRA, in um, January of 2017, this letter said uh, that you support a comprehensive assessment of the IPO market and gross spreads attendant. Have you actually undertaken that comprehensive assessment? Of the IPO market? Of gross spreads in the IPO market. Uh. Well, we study all aspects of the market. I have to tell you, I, I'm not familiar uh, with what our chief economist has uh, there, uh, but uh, we may have, and if we do, uh, I'll supply it to you. So I'm in a little stronger position than I was in when we had this correspondence. Mr. Eggers, who knows the venture capital community pretty well, and Mr. Hahn, who had the experience of this, have both agreed that this doesn't feel like a competitive market. The numbers we're talking about here dwarf the compliance costs that if we have a per perfectly calibrated Jobs Act, they, they dwarf the numbers that we're talking about. So now I've finally gotten an SEC commissioner and some fairly public uh, statements on this. Will FINRA undertake this study with the SEC to determine whether gross spread pricing for mid-market IPOs is truly competitive or whether there's some oligopolistic behavior? I'm not with FINRA. NASDAQ is independent of... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize for that. I, miss, uh, I misread your... Uh... I, I was at one time, but we're now independent. Okay. Okay, I apologize. So I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot. So no, maybe... I, I mean, frankly, what we see is a lot of com competition fr uh, amongst the banks to take companies public. Uh, the pricing issue, you know, is a, is, a, is a separate issue. But they're certainly competing out there uh, to get those assignments. Uh, and... Uh, and we have not seen signs of a lack of competition. Of course, Spotify recently took a different model uh, and, uh, and avoided that. So there's competition in models uh, that are, uh, that's emerging. And, you know, as technology uh, 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 changes here, I think you're going to see uh, more innovation. So um, okay. I think there's Th more happening. Thank you. You're back. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, gentleman from Maine, Mr. Poliquin, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Now, I know you have very stressful jobs, very stressful jobs, and I've got some great news for you. If you'll allow the chairman to interject, uh, yes, there sir. will not be additional time for the PSA for a Maine tourism. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, on Maine's license plate, it says vacation land. I want to make sure all these wonderful people in this room know that as you're planning a summer vacation, we don't even need air conditioning up there. We got moose walking around, all kinds of other critters, lobsters, blueberry pie. You need to go to Maine where you belong, get rid of these stressful <laughs> jobs. And, and I think their families will thank them for that. And if you could put another 35 seconds back on that clock, I'd be very grateful, Mr. Chairman. Motion now, denied. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> you know, there seems to be all this bad news that circulates this town. I'm not used to that. Uh, I represent the rural part of Maine, and um, we, we, have, we have a great problem to have up in Maine. We can't find workers. You know, I know the national unemployment rate's about 3.9%. We're at 2.7%. 
And I don't care if you want to have folks working on the docks or picking apples or working on precision machinery, we can't find those bodies. Um, business confidence is through the roof. Consumer confidence is high. We have seven million job openings across this country. And it's all because, and we know what it is, it's because regulations now are more predictable and there are fewer regulations. In the equity market's a forward-looking animal and they're looking at that and they're discounting it. On top of that is that we have lower taxes so our families can keep more of their own money and spend it the way they want to spend it. Uh, and our businesses are growing and they're investing. And Maine Second District is an economy of small businesses. Now, one of the things that keeps me up at night is how do we make sure there's access to capital so our business can grow all, all sizes. And some folks borrow money from banks and that's all great or credit unions. Some folks access the capital markets. It is critically important to make sure we keep these reforms going. I'm, I'm gonna tell you what you folks already know. If we start raising taxes, if we start layering more and more regulations like we have been the last 10 years, we're gonna be growing at half what we're growing at now. And when the economy grows, it's great for everybody. So one of the issues is how do we make sure these reforms continue. Now we all know what the stats are the last five or ten years. The number of uh, companies that have gone public have about cut in half roughly. Uh, I would like to know, Mr. Paschke, when you talk to folks in the boardroom, oh, Mr. Knight would probably be another good person to ask, what are they telling you? Are they telling you what we heard from Mr. Coffey a short time ago? What are their concerns and why are they choosing to stay private instead of going public? And secondly, a follow-up question. We now have a new SEC. You folks, for the most part, deal with the SEC on a regular basis. Do you see a change over there where these folks want to be helpful and not layer on and make it more difficult for you folks? Tell me what you see out there so we are apprised of what needs to be done. So, so answer two things very And quick. speak right up, sir. Get right in that microphone. Yeah. So answer two things very quickly. One, we just had a very productive working session with the SEC about three weeks ago a group that SIFMA had organized. Very constructive, very roll up your sleeves, very specific. Is Mr. Clayton in the room? Uh, he was not, but he then circled back with feedback on he had heard it was a very constructive Good. Meeting. So early returns feel quite good uh, in that regard and constructive. The second thing you talk about, what do they say about why they want to stay private? One is you can structure those investments however you want. The, the other part of this whole discussion that hasn't been talked about in terms of why didn't we see a huge jump in IPOs at, right after the Jobs Act, we've been operating in a you know near zero percent interest rate environment. Right. So there's been so much access to alternative forms of investment, right. either direct private investment on the equity side or very cheap debt on the public side or on the uh, debt side, that's had a major impact. As you see rising rates, what you're seeing actually is an increase in equity offerings from existing public companies. There's too much of an on-ramp for the IPOs to have caught up to the, the changing environment but that's gonna change. And I'm gonna highlight the one thing I keep highlighting here is for your district in Maine, the other way for those people to get wealth is to be able to invest in the public markets. They do not participate in the wealth creation that occurs in the private markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I worry about um, our small investors in Maine, folks that are uh, working on the docks or working in the woods or pulling traps or, or, or growing potatoes and these folks are saving as much as they can every week to go into a retirement nest egg uh, or to save for their, their kids' education. And, uh, and a lot of those investments, not all, but a lot of them, as you mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if you did, Mr. Uh, Quadman, mention this, uh, through um, retirement funds. Through, oh, I guess it was Mr. Gellich, through uh, state uh, and, and other private uh, employee benefit funds. So there are a lot of folks in this country, a lot of folks in our district who are owners of corporate America, and it's really important to make sure these regulations are helpful to them so they have a better opportunity to live a better lives and more freedom. With that, are you gonna award me, Mr. Chairman, another 35 seconds I rightly deserve? Uh, the uh, fine folks at uh, puremichigan.com have asked me to uh, evoke your time, uh, so the, uh, but uh, with that, the gentleman's time has expired. Thank so. you very much. All right, that would be puremichigan.com. Uh, and with that, <laughs> the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. And I really want to thank our witnesses. Thanks for the time you've committed to be here today and uh, for the work you do to advance uh, capital formation, uh, particularly with our small companies. Um, and Mr. Eggers, I wanted to talk about venture for a bit. Uh, and just the important role that venture plays in 
helping so many Americans realize their, their version of the American dream. Starting and growing a company in America uh, is trending in the right way. For a long time, we were seeing more companies uh, go out of business than launch. Uh, we've seen challenges in companies scaling. And I guess I'm curious, as you think about companies that want to access um, public, public markets, to go from uh, privately traded uh, founder capital to maybe a round of venture funding. One of the keys to getting scale is that next round of capital. Uh, it's one of the keys where the venture folks get paid for the risks that they've taken. How, um, how have you seen uh, the impact of the JOBS Act or other small capital formation initiatives uh, on, on the space? and uh, particularly with information coverage, the, the research uh, coverage for small companies. Uh, could you address that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think the JOBS Act has been effective in certain areas, and I mentioned the confidential disclosures and ability for a company to sort of test the waters, so to speak, uh, before they file, um, reduce uh, sort of reporting requirements, although when they get to a certain level, those uh, go away. But there's other fundamental issues um, that also sort of factor in to the problem of less IPOs. There's the uncertainty in the market once they're trading, the, the culture of short-termism, um, a whole bunch of stuff like that. Let me, let me tell you a story about one of our companies, App Dynamics. Uh, it was one of our really fastest growing companies uh, in the private area and raised a lot of venture capital and wanted to go public, went, uh, hired bankers, um, paid, paid that 7%, um, or they were going to pay that 7%. Um, they went through their road show successfully and they were gonna price the next morning and they decided instead to get acquired by Cisco Systems. Obviously for a premium on how they would price, but it makes you wonder um, why a company like that, a very good company, high growth company that's created a lot of jobs, would take the certainty of an acquisition over the uncertainty of the public markets. Yeah, thanks, good, good explanation. Mr. Quaman, how uh, do you see provisions of the Jobs Act, um, have you seen it boost coverage uh, in pre-IPO, uh, particularly for EGCs? It's, it's been mixed. Um, I, th I think, you know, the testing the water provisions certainly have helped, but I think in terms of research, it's been mixed. We still see a dearth of research for smaller issuers. So I think the, uh, the draft legislation here, I think, is going to be an important way to help incentivize some more of that research, um, which that research will then also help drive liquidity investors to those companies. Um, thank you. And maybe for, for the group, um, I'm working on an ICO bill. So when you look at companies that choose to raise capital through an initial coin offering, um, we're trying to get our arms around how early formation is different. Uh, it seems that a lot of the things in, uh, in the Jobs Act, in, in um, perhaps even in EGC designation or Reg A plus could help. Uh, have any of you spent time thinking about this with respect to uh, ICOs? Uh, Mr. Davidson, uh, <clears throat> this is something where we've put together a group of companies um, to look at this, um, and we are look we've actually had some meetings with Treasury, um, some meetings on the Hill as well, um, and we're trying to determine if that is a uh, way of helping with capital formation, but uh, we also have concerns about investor protection as well. So I think that's something we would like to have a further dialogue with you on. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Davison, uh, on the investor side, I, I'd like to echo uh, those remarks. Obviously, coin offerings have exploded themselves, uh, and there's a lot of interesting issues related to that. Are they securities, for example, is a really basic question um, that the regulators are wrestling with. One of the things I, I think, and you mentioned alternatives there, thinking about uh, do we put these things in the registered public space, the traditional public space, some scaled back version of that, do we go even further into like a Reg A plus type of model? I'd encourage you to, to, to think about those things very carefully because the Reg A plus experience is remarkably different than the ECG experience. 
Um, so as you think about alternatives, I'd, I'd encourage significant caution. Yeah, thank you for that. And clearly some would, would still qualify as commodities as CFTCs tried to make clear. And so we're talking secure, where does that line exist? Uh, my time has expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, seeing no further speak, or, uh, questioners on the, uh, on the Democrat side at this point, uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, thank you all for coming today and for your time and your input uh, and your insight. So this is an important hearing and one that is timely considering that Chairman Hensterling is negotiating a package of bills um, with the Senate that will focus on, yet again, capital formation. These bills would include some that have already passed the House, uh, including my own bill, H.R. 3903, which is encouraging public offerings, and possibly some proposals before the subcommittee today. I want to go back again, um, continue on where Mr. Davidson was asking about the JOBS Act. And uh, Mr. Quadman, um, can you please explain some of the regulatory requirements that emerging growth companies are exempt from under the JOBS Act in their on-ramp provisions? Uh, sure. There are, you know, there are certain executive compensation disclosures that uh, they're exempt from. There are certain, um, there's a potential for certain exemptions from uh, new audit or accounting standards as well. Um, and generally, um, it provides for uh, disclosures, but it's but done in a slimmed down version that allow for investors in those companies to get the uh, information that they need. Um, and it also allows for uh, some of more, the more costly uh, disclosures, such as, uh, let's say, conflict minerals or others, that they're exempt from also. So um, it's, it's a way of uh, allowing companies to grow into uh, the existing public company system and to eventually ramp up. Because one of the, the problems with Sarbanes-Oxley was, was that um, internal controls and all are extremely important. It was trying to make some of the costs scalable. And effectively, what the Jobs Act tried to do in, in a very broad way was to make it scalable and ensure that their investors are receiving the information that they need, as well as have the protections in place. Very good. So uh, why are, and you've answered some of this next part, but why are the exemptions provided in Title I so necessary for emerging growth companies? If you care to elaborate any more on that, maybe some other reasons. Yeah, it's, um, one is it, their investor base is more interested in uh, some of the things that the company is doing rather than what its sales are at that time. So it's, it, investors are much more forward looking there. Um, it, it also, as I said, it allows for an ability for a company to gradually work its way into a public company model because regardless of some of the discussion we've had here this morning, we've built in a lot of inefficiencies into the public capital markets. And effectively what the JOBS Act tries to do is tries to shield those emerging growth companies from some of those inefficiencies to, until a point where they can uh, deal with it. So we actually view the, the extension from five to 10 years will actually allow for existing EGCs a little more time and will also continue to make EGC, the EGC model a more attractive one. So why are things like the say on pay provisions, why are they not appropriate for these small EGCs? Well, first off, um, say on pay passes with 95, 90% with large public companies. And we've also had an issue, we don't have necessarily have an issue with say on pay itself. I mean, investors should have a dialogue with companies about executive compensation. But what has happened with the proxy advisory firms is that they've required a year-by-year -year vote, whereas Congress said, you know, investors can decide what the frequency is. So rather than have an, an entity or a, a duopoly like the proxy advisory firms place a very costly provision on, on, uh, on EGCs, Congress is actually somewhat going back to the intent that Dodd-Frank would say on pay to actually allow companies uh, some breathing room with that. So, that's one where I think, again, it's something where, where you have a founder um, type system with, with EGCs, which you pri primarily have. Investors are as invested in that founder as they are um, el you know, with the company itself. So say and pay is a, is a less relevant tool than it is for, let's say, a more mature company. Makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Quadman. Uh, Mr. Hahn, uh, since the enactment of the JOBS Act, about 260 biotech companies have used provisions in the Act uh, to go public. A lot of those are working on research that is ultimately going to save lives. Can you discuss with us in the partial minute that we have left how the on-ramp provisions have helped these companies better allocate their resources? I think the biggest provision that helped us was test the waters. 
So we have complex science and getting investors up to speed to understand the science and to want to invest in the company in the traditional two-week time span of, of a roadshow, oh, we would have lost a lot of investors with that. So Tesla Waters gave us the ability to, to bring those investors up to speed. And also with the 404B exemption we talked about, that helps us save uh, money, divert money into the science instead of a one-size-fits-all regulatory burden. Appreciate that. I believe my time has expired. Again, thank you all. Amazing self-discipline. The gentleman's time was almost ready to expire. So uh, uh, with that, uh, the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, we've got a bunch of bills that are designed to help small companies uh, get capital one way or the other. And then included in discussion for this hearing is a bill designed to prevent shareholders from being able to put forward questions for a vote and be included in the proxy statement. Mr. Coffey, are you aware of any small startup in a garage that has ever had a second presentation of the same shareholder question in their proxy statement? That small startup isn't subject to the proxy rules in most cases, so it's gonna to be totally inapplicable. Uh, but I think you're right in pointing out that unrelated to the IPO concerns of raising capital, there are provisions in here that downsize the shareholder voice in challenging corporate conduct. And there are other provisions in here that give major uh, exemptions to what are called well-known season issuers, our largest companies, and allow them directly to sell before filing a disclosure document. That's got nothing to do with small firms. That's our largest top quarter firms, and it's just a wish list of various deregulatory proposals various people on this committee agree to. Uh, so I don't think there's a clear, rationalized coherence to all this. But on your first uh, point. Yeah, and, and, and I'm aware of the social benefit put forward by making these issues come to light. And uh, I think it taints the rest of the bills that we're discussing to throw in here something that has nothing to do with raising capital for small or big companies and everything to do with suppressing discussion of important issues um, uh, that, uh, that face uh, corporations in, in their operation. Uh, next point I want to make is a uh, number of the issues come in, how much money will we as a society spend on investor protection? And some would say, well, as a society as a whole, we're spending a billion dollars on this aspect of investor protection, and maybe we're avoiding a billion dollars of fraud, so that balances out. No, it doesn't. It's a good thing for society, because a billion dollar fraud loss, it doesn't just affect the people who lose their money. It dampens public interest, foreign interest, retail interest in investing in stocks. And having the game be fair is worth every penny that is necessary to achieve that. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Gerlash, uh, um, there's this proposal here to slash uh, 404 uh, B audits to increase by double or triple the various uh, 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 floors um, and in effect say we'll save a lot of money on uh, worrying about internal control and we'll maybe only have one or two Enrons a decade as a result, probably smaller company, uh, you know, or, or, or smaller examples of that. Um, what do you think of uh, the need for uh, attestation of internal control and reports on internal control? Well, I think we've seen examples both not just Enron, but also in the in the private company space like mm -hmm. Theranos, um, where uh, the need for robust internal controls and financials is important. And some of the smartest guys in the room uh, in the private space uh, have uh, proven ineffective at being able to do those things themselves in their own due diligence. So one of the things that's really important for the public capital markets, as you alluded to earlier, is ensuring that you have investor confidence and you don't lose it. And the uh, accuracy of financial statements is critically important to investors. Uh, 
And so when we think about what the costs are associated with that, and I certainly appreciate and, and respect those, um, may not be trivial. That's fair. Um, I think, but that is also... And, and if I could see, it's not just important to investors. Um, you may have some division of a company or what, uh, where they're having signing parties, forging documents for mortgages, um, et cetera, where you're hurting consumers. How is internal control important for those other than investors? Exactly right. It, it, it's, a, it's a corporate governance issue that is far beyond just an investor uh, protection measure. And one of the things I think we, we, we tend to focus on is just the cost associated with that. I would say what's also really important is focusing on that aspect. These are improving the quality of the offerings, including the quality of the companies and how they're governed. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. With that, the gentleman from New Jersey, uh, Mr. MacArthur, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Appreciate all of you being here. Uh, I am proudly wearing this pin. You probably can't see it from back there, but it's a uh, Foster uh, Youth Shadow Day. And uh, Raishan, stand up. Stand up. This is Raishan from my district. Young man, very interesting young man. Very, yep, give him a, give him a hand. He's got an entrepreneurial spirit. I can tell you that just from our conversations this morning. He's doing all kinds of things and very interested in both philanthropy and in growing a business. Uh, we all know it takes more than hopes and aspirations and dreams and ideas. It takes money and it takes a path that is not completely cluttered with uh, obstacles. I know, because that's the life I lived for 30 years, growing a business. So I'm listening this morning. First, I'm impressed that he's awake, because some of this stuff could make anyone's eyes glaze over when you, when you listen to this. But, but this translates into real people's lives that want to do things. And I had, as we do in this business, I had to step in and out this morning, and so I've missed a lot of things. But I was here for the opening remarks. And Mr. Coffey, I was really struck by yours. Uh, it's a great name, by the way. If you weren't a professor, it'd be a great name for a business, Mr. Coffey. Uh, that's been done. It took money for them to grow that business. I used to handle their insurance many decades ago. It takes money to grow a business. And I listened to you. I'm not meaning to poke fun. I'm just, uh, uh, I just was struck by your remarks. And you said that the reason companies don't really need the public markets. It's not because of regulatory overreach or overzealous attorney generals who criminalize uh, management mistakes. None, it's none of that. It's just that companies can get money from the venture world or the private equity. I think you said the venture world, but I think that may include other. Private equity firms also, I said. Well, sure. Well, let me, tell you, let me tell you the decision I had to make when we got to a state where my business was big enough that I thought I could go public and there'd be enough float to actually make that viable. We had gone from 100 odd people to thousands. We could have done that. Why did I choose something other than private equity? I just left a meeting, one of the meetings I had to step out for, uh, was with a person that works with the exchanges. And I asked her the question, why don't companies go public? She said, the number one reason I hear is they are deathly afraid of overzealous regulators and state attorney generals. That's their number one reason. And then I think about your remark that, well, it's not that. Under-regulation is, uh, is far less dangerous than, uh, or far more dangerous than over-regulation. Equally dangerous, I meant. <laughs> here's, here's the problem with that. If you really get practical, this doesn't, this doesn't play out no disrespect intended, but this stuff doesn't play out in a classroom. It plays out in the real world with real uh, pressures coming from all sides. Venture capital, private equity capital, all of it is the most expensive form of capital for a business person to access. By far the most expensive. More expensive than the public markets. More expensive than debt capital or any of the alternatives around that. It comes with the greatest amount of outside control because private equity funds, private equity uh, funds, venture funds, this is what they do every day. And they don't give their money without exacting a price. 
without getting certain controls, without getting certain investment thresholds. It's the longest liquidity possible outcome. You, you take capital from those sources and you're going to wait five, six, seven years or more. So why would a rational business person choose that anyway? Most costly, most control lost, longest liquidity event. Sir, with respect, it's not because it's just easy money and it has nothing to do with the state of the public markets. I'm telling you from personal experience, it has to do with the fact that the public markets are frightening to business people who don't want to get squeezed and attacked and have a management mistake criminalized and all of the other stuff that comes with it. Now, I don't usually make speeches with my five minutes. I usually ask questions, but my speech has lasted five minutes. And so with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. A uh, gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is recognized for five minutes. Thank the chairman. I want to thank my friend from New Jersey because of his five-minute speech. I, may, I have more time for questions because I enjoyed it. I associate myself with it, and it reflects the experience I've had for 35 years in, in corporate finance. So I appreciate my friend, Mr. MacArthur, and his perspective on the public and private uh, markets. Uh, it's been it's been said, you know, that we want more public companies. All of you agree with that universally to give more opportunities for our pension funds, our 401k plans, our IRA accounts, and that there is absolutely no uh, reason to say that's not the primary objective. We want that opportunity because it shares the prosperity of America. So then it gets down to well, how do we accomplish that? And one is in sales and trading and research and bringing that company out. That's a key component that we're talking about today. And then the other is the cost of maintaining that public enterprise. And so we've got bills on sort of both sides of those issues. Um, and I was with a company a couple of weeks ago. It's a publicly traded company, $2 billion market cap. One division uh, has 5,000 suppliers. That's a lot. And it's, you can imagine they have a lot of things that they sell to have 5,000 suppliers. But one of the most costly things they have in this uh, public company, longtime public company, $2 billion market cap, is trying to comply with the conflict minerals rule. It just, it just it takes over their whole process trying to prove that they've done that in case they're sued, which they, of course, fully expect to be, uh, because it's not possible to comply with it with 5,000 suppliers in just one division that in a globally sourced enterprise. And so that's an example of what we're talking about, I think, today on the second piece, the cost of maintaining that public enterprise in a competitive, in a competitive way. Uh, Mr. Quadman. Uh, there was a lot of discussion today about studying research coverage for small issuers before they have an IPO. I'd love for your perspective on maintaining coverage of a small cap issuer after they're public, and then I'll ask Mr. Uh, Pascal to comment as well. No, I think, no, that, that's a great question because we've actually seen some problems with that, where there, there's actually been a retrenchment of research at times as well. And uh, the reason why I raised MIFID uh, with uh, my opening remarks is that EU rule is actually going to, is going to impact research here and is going to impact costs. So it's a matter of, it's a supply and demand issue, right? If, what are the costs of the research? What are the, um, how is it priced out? And it's unfortunate that um, I think the JOBS Act tried to address some of that, but we actually need to do more of that. And we're gonna have to try and also determine with the SEC, how we also deal with this in terms of MIFID as well. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Pascal, what's your view on that in the marketplace? Mark, Mike. It's an absolutely major issue. As I mentioned, we cover 600 companies in research with a focus on small mid-cap, and the, the data shows that for companies with a $500 million market cap and below, they have an average about three research analysts covering them. Larger cap often will have 25 plus. So it's very important, and those voices that cover them are the voice to the market. MIFID was an appropriate thing to bring up because most market estimates say that the cost that the buy side is willing to pay for sell side research is going to come down by about a third through unbundling. 
So if you're a small cap name and there's two or three research channels covering you today, and the research budget just went down by a third, you may lose one to two of yeah. them. I think it's super important, and I think this $500 billion number is a reasonable number. The company I referenced, $2 billion market cap, has six regular uh, uh, research firms covering them. I was surprised by that and delighted, and some have long standing. It's a mix of regional firms and Wall Street firms. In the time I have remaining, I just want to bring up one other issue for you representing SIFMA. Just like we talk about community banks needing uh, relief from regulations. I think the same is true for privately held non-bank broker dealers. And one way to do that is I have a bill that's going to permanently exempt uh, the peekaboo standard, the audit standard for small private broker dealers. And I would hope that SIFMA would look at that issue and be supportive of a permanent waiver effectively for uh, the peekaboo standard on audit for a small broker dealer. It's an introducing broker, not holding customer funds. Yeah, it's my understanding that that was definitionally caught up in Dodd-Frank and that some brokers who probably wasn't appropriate for the privately held non-custodial brokers were caught up with some of the regulations, which it would seem to us would make sense. Uh, Good. Make I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks for the uh, committee, or the uh, witnesses being here today before this committee and your patience. Uh, the Treasury, and Mr. Paschke, I'll, I'll start with you. I'm going to read you a statement from uh, an October 2017 Treasury Department report that I think goes to something that you started to talk about a few questioners before and that, frankly, Chairman Huizinga brought up at the very beginning of this hearing today. The quote is this, or uh, the Treasury report noted that, quote, to the extent that companies decide not to go public due to anticipated regulatory burdens Regulatory policy may be unintentionally exacerbating wealth inequality in the United States by restricting certain investment opportunities to high income and high net worth investors. I mean, isn't that what we're talking about here today with these? This isn't just pro growth, but uh, of the 11 bills, uh, much of it is addressing the fact that it, you got to be too big to play in this country today. And the thing that used to distinguish us from every other uh, country on the face of the planet is that any uh, rank and file member of our society who wanted to participate in the marketplace to grow his or her wealth and help grow the wealth of this great nation, that's been restricted uh, over the last many years. And, and it, isn't that exactly what you were trying to get to earlier? I think it's absolutely one of the most fundamental issues that's going on is who can participate in the wealth creation. And you know, for sure the small individual retail investor who has no access or idea about these opportunities is excluded. It's even gotten to the point where the mutual fund, active fund managers who are often managing money on behalf of a lot of small individuals or pension funds or police you know, unions, whatever it may be, they're complaining that because companies are going public either later or never at all, that they're missing out on the entire wealth creation that occurs with an Uber or a Spotify or whoever it may be, these companies have achieved huge valuations all through private capital. So it's not just mom and pop retailer, it's active money management funds who don't have access to the private investment either, who provide one more uh, layer away for the individual. So it, if I, I may for a moment, just to, to it, one thing I think that's important, though, is they all actually have, those investment advisors and pension funds actually are likely to be able to physically have access to those markets. The reason why they're not accessing them right now is because of the risks and costs associated with the, a lot of those investments. Would you, so every mutual fund or investment advisor. So you disagree with the Treasury's uh, uh, statement? No, I, I actually wholly agree. I think that we have to recognize that, one, when you bifurcate, the retail investor, mon pa with an E-Trade account, from the mutual fund investor or the pension funds, which are, in fact, the majority of how Americans actually invest in these companies. And those folks who are the fiduciaries, who are in charge of those, um, are actually saying, look, we, we actually do not want to and have investment guidelines that say we're not going to get involved, or we are to a very small extent in these private offerings or in venture investments in large part because of the costs and risks associated with them. Well, Which is exactly the point that was made by the previous speaker about it's the most expensive capital out there. Right. So to say that the private companies ought to be going there instead of public 
And that's what we're trying to address. That's exactly what we're trying to address. Mr. Knight, uh, I've got the Venture Exchange Bill, and uh, I appreciate uh, it in his remarks, his opening remarks, Professor Coffey likes the concept, uh, but has some issues with how it's drafted. Can you, uh, I know you're familiar with this uh, provision, can you give us uh, just a picture of what it would look like if, if uh, entity was going to apply to become a venture exchange? What would they do? What's the timeline with the SEC? Well, under your legislation, the SEC, the SEC would have six months to uh, determine whether they meet the qualifications uh, to become uh, the venture exchange. Uh, on our market, we would already be qualified, and the issue would be whether the company would choose that market structure, that uh, the optionality that is in your legislation, that it would allow the aggregation of trading interest in, in one market. Right now, it is split amongst 50, with work, which works well when you're trading Amazon, but it uh, tends to drain the liquidity away from the price discovery process. We tend to be very focused in the United States on competition between marketplaces and don't focus enough on having the competition for price discovery between orders and quotes. And that, that needs to be aggregated, particularly for small companies, if you're going to have a liquidity thickness that you need so that people can sell securities, buy securities on an orderly basis. Thank you. I see my time's expired. Gentlemen's time has expired, uh, but this has been fascinating, very helpful, uh, and I'd like to thank our witnesses today uh, for their uh, testimony. Uh, without objection, I'd like to submit the following statements uh, for the record from the Equity Dealers of America. Uh, uh, my uh, ranking member, Ms. Maloney, had taken care of a couple of others uh, earlier. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days with, with, within which to submit additional written questions uh, for the witnesses. They'll come to the chair, which uh, we will then forward them uh, to our witnesses for your response. I just uh, ask uh, for the witnesses to respond uh, as timely and, re and promptly as possible. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record as well. And again, I would like to thank our panelists. Um, I think this has been, uh, been helpful and illuminating, and uh, we look forward to this uh, continued conversation. With that, the hearing is adjourned.